last session of the day before we get into some wrap up and some conclusions, I'm going to tackle debt investor relations. Um, this is something that, you know, I think perhaps investor relations officers began to think about more after the financial crisis, when even equity investors became very focused on what companies' debt loads were, what their leverage was, what their balance sheet looked like. Um, what we heard was that equity investors started to ask many of the same questions that debt investors were asking. We saw many companies start to go out and do almost dual road shows uh, to line up meetings with both the debt side and the equity side the institutions that they were visiting. Um, we're going to explore this topic now. And with us to, to do this, let me tell you who we have. So next to me here is Catherine Sito from Shuntak. Now, Catherine is director. She's head of investor relations. Um, Shuntak is a 14 billion Hong Kong dollar market cap uh, investment holding company. It's in property, transportation, hospitality, investment. Um, and Catherine leads the team in charge of IR, but also assisting corporate finance. Okay, uh, and before um, Shuntak for around eight, uh, she's been with Shuntak for eight years. Before that, she worked in corporate finance at various investment banks. So a corporate finance background, which is, lends itself well to what we're talking about here, debt investor relations. Justin Reynolds is managing director for Asia Pacific at IPRIO, market intelligence firm. Um, he leads the 45 strong Asia Pacific uh, team for IPRIO. Um, and he has worked in capital markets intelligence and corporate governance for more than 14 years. Before IPRIO, Justin was at Sedali and also worked for ISS and Georgeson. And Justin, I want to start with you. I want you to give us some context. The question has got to be, why do debt IR at all? I mean, for a lot of companies, the view is simply that, well, if, if you issue debt, the investment bank places the issuance, that's it, end of story. You, from now on, you, you sit back, you make your interest payments, and you know, that's it. No more, you have nothing more to do with debt investors. Why is that wrong? Well, it's not, it's not wrong. You could certainly do that. Um, you know, and, there, and I think there are many companies that, that do do that. I think the, the main answer to that is that they're owners, right? Your debt holders are owners. They, they, they own something that, that uh, they own a security that the company has, you know, has issued. Um, and they actually have more rights than equity holders. So if you look at some of the problems that companies have got into, the media and people like myself and others, you know, having a drink, we'll talk a lot about the share price of the equity and the, and the likes. But actually, the pressure is coming quite heavily from the debt holders onto, onto the company to do something about it. Olam in Singapore is a very good example of that. And you could actually watch a lot of the equity holders switching into the debt to protect themselves, right? Because the debt holders have a lot more... Um, uh, rights. If, 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 and it didn't, but if Olam was to be wound up, the debt holders would get paid up for the equity holders. Um, I think the other one is, is, is that they are long term. So, you know, the, um, earlier panel, Dr. Sun was talking about, you know, long term shareholders. The question was about long term shareholders. Debt holders are long term. They, they, they buy the security that has been issued and they will sit there for as, for as long as, long as they, they possibly can. Now, there is obviously a secondary market that trades. So if you run an investor relations campaign on the equity side, you're trying to, you know, what you're trying to do is trying to drive the valuation of the company. A lot of that is through, through hopefully, the buying of, of your equity. You can do the same on, on the debt side. You can, you can go out and talk to the debt holders, um, you know, give, them, give them the story that they're looking for. It's generally a lot more technical than perhaps on an equity. The equity holders are looking for, for vision, for growth, you know, for the future, as the debt holders are looking a lot more for technical analysis of the company and how the company is doing. Um, but you can still drive trading in that, and through that you can reduce cost of capital, you can reduce um, the next time that you go out into the market to look, you know, to issue debt to fund something, the cost of capital and the, and the debt holders that will p participate in that, you know, may be, may be greater, um, the addressable audience, as, as per the earlier, um, um, panel and it, you know they basically whilst they whilst the debt holders are operating in a different paradigm in a different security looking at the company in a different way they still are owners of the company well they're owners of the security unlike equity holders who do own a piece of the company but they own a security nonetheless that gives them rights 
It gives them power. And as you say, you may need you need them on your side. So Olam in Singapore, I, I mean, could have been an example of that. Um, is this is this something that uh, perhaps could happen more? Is it something that's coming? Is it something that that companies should look that should 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 be on on the guard with in a, in a sense? Like for example, um, SunTech is that an example. Of, of, of this happening, of, of bondholders bringing pressure to bear on a company? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And there, there are a number of examples all around the world. The one that I love is Elliott Advisors when they, when they were you know, arguing with the Argentine government about their debt and then they captured one of their ships and took it as collateral. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a hell of an activist move. But um, you know, debt holders generally are, are more friendly. I, I, I hope I'm right on that than, than equity. But that's just their nature because they, they do buy for the, long, for the long term. But because they have more rights and because they um, are, you know, they don't necessarily get to vote at a shareholders meeting and they don't get to do that type of activity with, with the company. Um, but it's mainly because they have more rights that if the company is to get into some element of trouble, not necessarily to the extent that SunTech got into trouble, but just generally into a little bit more of a difficult time and really needs the support of all the different constituents out there that, that you know, the company um, you know, has through different securities, the debt holders are going to be the more difficult constituent because, because they have more rights. Right, right? okay. So that, yes, they own a different type of security, but you can basically, in many ways, in comparison to the debt holders, you can ignore your equity holders, right? Because they have less rights and they've bought it with the concept of that they might be losing something. Everything is written. You may, you may lose what you've just paid for this. But with yeah. debt, they have the rights that protect them. Right, OK. So Catherine, let's hear about how this works in practice. Mm. So uh, Shuntak earlier this year, 400 million US dollar debt issuance. Uh, tell us about how the IR around that issuance works and how it, for that matter, it works on an ongoing basis with your fixed income investors. Well, I think, you know, um, in addition to what Justin has mentioned, it's actually very important to maintain a long-term relationship with the, you know, fixed income community to a great extent. Because I think, as a matter of fact, we just issued a 400 uh, million US bond. But as a practice, usually the banks will help you to offer an MTM program, which is a medium-term loan program. So to a great extent, we actually have been offered a 1 billion US MTM program. So in practice, that is just like I was on the road with um, meeting debt holders recently. So it's important to maintain very constant contact with them, even though they don't need to like, you know, equity holders. They want to pick up the phone whenever they see some news on you. They are more like really long term. They probably will like, you know, depends on the term of the loan. It will be like five, 10 years or even maximum of maybe even 30 years. Whereas for these guys, you know, if actually they've participated, especially in your first tranche, and they actually have built up a very strong relationship with you, and as a matter of fact, they trust your credit worthiness, which is a key component for, mm -hmm. for effects income guys, then they will be more than happy to actually offer you the second tranche. So to a great extent, I was asked by one of the fixed income um, analysts, they said, I'm very happy with your bond issuance. So when are you going to, you know, to issue the, the, the tranche, the second tranche you probably need? So for us, it's like, you know, because the, the, the debt market offer a very different type of capital, which is more like a fixed rates mm -hmm. notes to us. So it actually helped us to to balance a very healthy treasury. So we need to work very closely with our treasury departments because we always have like, you know, different bilateral lines and indicate loans. And I think because in the current market, the, the interest rate is low. So a lot of people will definitely list the companies because we're trying to tap into yeah. the debt market. So I think that's one of the reasons debt issuance has been quite popular, in particular in the last few years. Yeah, you, in fact, you shared with me a, a look at debt issuance versus equity issuance in Hong Kong. It was remarkable to see, um, since 2007, debt issuance in Hong Kong growing from about 300 billion uh, Hong Kong dollars a year to over 880 billion. Um, the same time equity issuance has actually gone down Correct. over that time, and, and last year was uh, was under 300 yep. billion. Um, the, Catherine, tell us what, about the the different questions, the different concerns. You mentioned, for example, credit worthiness is a, obviously a top priority for, for debt holders. Mm -hmm. But if you're going into an equity investor meeting and the type of questions you get there versus 
debt holder meetings, what are the different matrix that, that of questions that they might be asking? Well, I think because of the nature is very different, you know, for equity holders, they obviously will trade, you know, there are different type of funds, you know, unit trust funds, mutual funds, you know, hedge funds. There's a lot of active tradings. Whereas for like bond markets, apart from the primary, the secondary market is pretty much like a bearer market. So uh, it's more opaque, you know, in a sense, it's more difficult for IR professionals to gauge who are really your, your bond holders. But after your really, you know, um, constant conversation with them, you pretty much have a good idea who are your bondholders. And actually the nature of the question is somewhat, some questions are similar, some questions are different. You know, the common question is obviously they need to understand your business. They want to understand the strategy because equity holders want to know, understand the strategy as well. But for bondholders, they probably, because they have a longer tenor, they will be pretty much focused on your long-term goal and they would like to understand your credit worthiness, whether you're able to service your debts, how are you going to pay your interest payments. These are the really core questions that probably you will get from you know, bondholders. They're more concerned about your interest coverage, you know, um, a lot of on the balance sheet side, they are more concerned. Whereas for like equity holders, they're more inter they want to inter understand your potential growth story. Mm -hmm. So because they have a higher tolerance you know, to the risk factor. So apparently they don't want to like, you know, listen to just pu purely about your balance sheets item. Obviously they're not taking into account a lot more about, you know, debt and how you serve into debt, your net debt ratio. But to a great extent, they're still more focused on your EPS ratios. You know, that is more like, you know, the profit driven, the ROA, ROE. These mm -hmm. are like sort of the matrix that equity holders would like right. to, to understand. Now, equity holders, of course, want to meet management. They want to assess the quality of management. They want to come and see your operations. They want to kick the tires, as they say. What about debt holders? Do they want to come out and see your, your properties and see your, your operations? Well, I would say yes, you know, to a great extent, you know, Justin has been right in the sense, you know, usually the equity holders are, tends to be less, uh, 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 more aggressive, where it sounds like, you know, fixed income analysts tends to be nicer, but uh, apparently they <laughs> are also aggressive, you know, uh, fund managers who are working for, you know, fixed income side as well. Mm -hmm. So, but on, in terms of ratio, obviously, you know, the equity size are more, they're more like, onto the boards, which is like, they want to see, understand the information immediately. You know, when there's news and everything, they would call you right away. And they want to have a feel and a sense of your site visits and their, you know, your sites, your programs, you know, your factory visits and everything. Whereas for, I would say, debt holders, they tend to be slightly laid back. They won't be like, oh, I want, to, I want to see it immediately. They will actually tend to spend a longer time. They will be like waiting. So to a great extent, that's also a reflection on your post results program. You know, post results, sometimes equity holders, you know, you've been meeting with, you know, um, analysts and fund managers with different brokers. But you can see, obviously, the bigger funds will on, won't always want to have the first one on one with you. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, for debt holders, I'll be asking, you know, my brokers, can you, can, we, can you please arrange, you know, I have a debt program now, so I want to meet my debt holders as well. They will be, you know, having a feedback from debt holders that they, they, will, they can wait. Now, you raise an interesting point, because I wanted to ask you about how you work with brokers on this. So, the, the same brokers that are covering your equity invested institutions are also covering fixed income investors, is that right? So can you work, for, say, with Morgan Stanley on going out to meet both equity and debt holders? I tend, I tend to believe that it really depends on the firm, you know, because some, some houses do have very strong, like, you know, their research coverage, and then they also have their credit research analyst that probably would cover your firm. So mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, for their corporate assets team, they can work out together to form a program like Morgan Stanley. I did actually attend the conference and then they were able to, you know, um, actually have arranged meetings of like probably 80% with my equity holders and 20, 23% with bond holders. But not every firm probably can offer the same. You know, some will be more focused on like the debt programs. Okay. So, we, so I think it's really like um, the brokerage house depends on, on, on the capacities. Okay, now, Justin, what about some of these practical aspects of going out to see these investors? Do you have any suggestions about you know, who you work with and how you identify meetings? And for that matter, how you understand how the same 
institutional investor might hold both equity and debt and the different interests that those parties have. I think, I think your, your last point is, is, is probably the most important, is understanding what an institution's total um, holding is in, in your company. So um, we, one of the things that, 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 that slightly worries me is, is that sort of debt IO, although it's different, it's different with Shantek, but debt IO is often sat within the Treasury Department and it's done very much by Treasury and it's kind of standalone. Um, whereas obviously equity is in the investor relations team and, and that's, you know, standalone as well. And I think a company understanding, specifically they offer a lot of debt and they've obviously listed, you know, equity, is understanding all the different holders that they have within all the different types of, of issuances that, 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 that they have, you know, um, all the way from sort of corporate loans all the, all the way through to, you know, to the equity. The, on the practical side, the identification of it is, is basically exactly the same. The difference is the clearing. So the clearing... For, for equity in Hong Kong is basically into CCAS in the end. But the clearing for debt is generally into Euroclear or Clearstream, yeah. right? And, but the identification of it is, is basically the same way. Um, you know, the using of, of brokers and the sell side to go out and meet them is, is absolutely the right, the right way to do it. And I would think the preparation of it is, is, is generally the same. It's really understanding who it is you're gonna go and talk to. Um, do you wanna meet them? Should you know what you know? What is their ability to hold in you to, to buy up to sell down the same? You know, because the secondary market in the debt world is is increasing. Um, I think a lot of people do think that you just issue, yeah. and then it kind of just sits there. Um, it may it may very well do. You know, Pimco. It's a bit like saying you know, does BlackRock hold your equity? Well, absolutely, they hold your equity. You know, does Pimco hold your debt? Sure, they hold your debt. But it's outside of those that become more interesting, and mm -hmm. the guys who are who are trading um, in 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 the you know in the fixed income as well as in, as in the equity, and that that using very similar techniques to the equity that can be tracked um, in the you know in the fixed income world. Uh, Catherine mentioned the you know this a pretty attractive environment for companies to be issuing debt, low interest rates. It's a it can be a, a low cost of capital. Give us a sense of what the sort of bigger, longer term trends have been and may will be going forward. Uh, we talked about how here in Hong Kong, debt issuance has, has more than doubled in the last five, six years. Um, looking ahead, if interest rates start to creep up again, it could, could it be more expensive for companies? Would debt be a less attractive financing option? I don't know, Justin, if you can suggest maybe a, a, a bigger picture look at this in the context. Yeah, I think there are probably better people in the audience who can predict that than, than I can. But um, I mean, there is always the, the playoff between how much debt you have and how much equity you have, and, and creating that balance, that financing mm -hmm. balance within a company. Um, obviously, you know, interest rates and money and circulation have, have have a lot to be, you know, have have a lot of influence on that. Um, but I'll give you some some idea. I mean, what, one of the one of the areas that's not hugely known about IPRIO is we run, we run the sell side community for debt um, ar around, around the world. And, and that's, this is the primary side. So we, we're not involved in the, in the secondary or the trading at all, but just the primary. And so a lot of debt that is issued is, is, is issued over this, this um, sell side community or through the sell side community. And so just for this year, um, $1.4 trillion of, of debt has been issued through that. Um, and this is what we're seeing because it's it's our technology that is that is running it, um, and it and it is it is on you know it, it is on the rise. And just in the last three months, there have been 30 deals in in Hong Kong that that we've seen right throughout. Now, outside of that, there are obviously deals being run outside of of, of IPRIO systems. Um, and I and I can't I, specifically with the other side that I, you can't really discount is with the increasingly amount of regulation and rules and problems in the equity world. I just can't, I, I can only see companies going more and more to debt just because it is in many ways a friendly environment, mm. an easier environment. Um, it's less talked about in the press, you have less to manage and all the, all, the, all the rest of it. But the point to remember there is that as that develops and as the secondary market develops, the the way that the buy side um, can make money, that the traders can make money, they will start to move into the fixed income side, right? At the moment, everyone thinks the traders are in equity, they're gonna move into the fixed, um, fixed income side. The activists will move into there. Um, mm. Because if that's where 
the liquidity and the play is happening, then, then you, know, you can certainly move into that. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I would have expected that this would be a very strong year for debt issuance. After all, companies want to get in before interest rates come back up, right? And we have seen, for that matter, companies like Apple do its first ever debt issuance, the biggest ever in the world, uh, in order that they could do a share yeah. buyback. Right? So companies actually levering up in order to turn around and, and return cash, to return that cash they just raised back to shareholders. There's yeah. an interesting dynamic. But and, and the CBs that the US just Chinese companies are starting, are starting to issue as well. Find, find that very interesting. There have been like three or four, maybe a couple more of them mm -hmm. um, just lately. And, that, and, and that, you know, that, I think, is an interesting move as well. What about the, the, the developing Chinese municipal bond market, how could that affect corporate debt in this region? Yeah, so that, I mean, that is, that is specifically with Cinder IPOing at the same time, you know, that, that is, I think, is all generally linked. But it's a, you know, the, the, the moving in China from the financing from, from, you know, Beijing level or party level down to the state level is, you know, is the mimic of municipal issuances in, in other parts of the world. I think that that is going to that is only going to open up the, the debt markets further because to do that the the chinese municipal municipalities are going to need to access eventually is going to need to access capital from outside china and that and that will only you know open up the shanghai um, free trade area and and you know the the, the increasing um, um, use of RMB in, in financing. It's the, num it's the number two financing currency in the world at the moment. You know, all of that is, I think, is going to drive the, the use of debt, um, specifically out of China, into um, obviously initially domestically and then and then internationally. And and the corporates can can run off the back of that, as mm -hmm. specifically as the currency, um, the fungibility of the currency changes. I think corporates will be able to run off that quite nicely. Good point. Okay. Um, any questions either for Catherine or for Justin from the audience at this point? Um, the, you know, I, I want to still follow up with Catherine and any more advice or tips you have in terms of organizing, a, you know, for example, in terms of the format of a meeting or the type of presentation you give, um, as you said, uh, you know, the, the debt investors are interested in many of the same things about the health of the business, your strategy, your growth plans and so on. Do you use the same slide deck, or do you have a different presentation for a debt meeting versus an equity meeting? Well, we actually try to keep you know, all the information open, no matter you are equity holders or debt holders. So actually, to a great extent, we actually have put additional pages to our existing presentation. So we actually provide additional. I think you know, for equity holders, they're entitled to have more information, even though we have debt holders. So we'll be giving more mm. about you know, our balance sheet analysis. So I think it will be fair to share between the, the debt holders and the equity holders. But you know, one point I'm actually think of it is actually quite interesting. There are like sometimes um, conflict. I wouldn't say totally conflict of interest, but it's actually they are standing on two sides of the of, of the pole. You know, between bondholders and shareholders. For sometimes, like you know, if you talk about rights issues. For, for equity holders, obviously, I think a lot of the IRs will know they will be very upset if you do a rights issue after you try to tell them a nice story, they get in and become your holders, and then now you do a rights issue. However, for bondholders, they're taking a very different stand. They think mm -hmm. there's a great thing you did a rights issue because you have more cash in your balance sheet, so you have the cushion, and, and you know, you'll be able to service your debts, and then they don't think that it's safe that you'll be able to pay your interest payments as well. So at some other times, you know, when, when like, you know, uh, share buyback programs, you know, equity holders will be very happy you do because you do a share buyback program. However, sometimes bondholders will take a different stand. They think that, okay, you are using your cash, which is your mm -hmm. cushion. You know, they will be more concerned. But I think, you know, as an IRO, you just need to be honest about your, your program and be consistent about what you really want to do. And you don't need to say one story just to please one audience and say the other story to please the other audience. I think, you know, they are just the same, you know. As a matter of fact, some bigger funds, they will probably have the equity side and um, to a great extent, they also have the fixed income sides. But, you know, it, it's important to keep a, a honest and um, 
real intentions of what you're going to use your cash for and what is your real program. I think that really will pay back in really long term. It's interesting to think of, of those two different audiences often being under the same roof. As you say, at the same investing mm -hmm. institution, you can have the fixed income guys and the equity guys. They may have very different interests. As you say, for example, one group wants the rights issue, one group doesn't want a rights issue, it's dilutive to their holdings. But they work for the same institution, right? Uh, do they talk to each other? This is a question I have. Do they, are they comparing notes? Are they even sometimes in the same meeting with you? Um, I hardly have a meeting shared between equity holders and bond holders. From and, the same? Yeah, the same so group, they yeah. usually will be in a separate meeting, even mm -hmm. though I'm meeting the same funds. Okay. So uh, apparently, just I mentioned earlier, their matrix are very different. So uh, all of them want to have their question fired out immediately rather than <laughs> waiting for the other side of the house to try to fire out the question. So obviously, they, they, they a lot of the time want to have separate meetings. But okay. I do see that some of them, you know, especially for bigger funds, they will be sharing, you know, information as well. Okay. So that's, that's exactly the point I mentioned. You know, if you try to do some programs, be honest about it. You know, sometimes don't need to say something you please the equity owners for the sake of the bondholders mm -hmm. because, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes they will, you know, they, they won't have a formal meeting sharing, but apparently they are, some, especially, you know, for credit analysts, sometimes yeah. they would l l try to collect information on a more longer term. Okay. So they will be like, you know, sort of like a due diligence on, from different angles. Good point, so. okay. Well, listen. Let's. Uh, do you have anything to add? To uh, I was just. I was just going to add one. One thing on that with the debt holders. It's, it's an obvious statement, but I, I think it gets um, forgotten about a little bit. Is there's always an end game with the debt holders, right? What, what, whatever it is, you have an end game with them. You know, you're going to have to pay them out, or, or or you might have to do an exchange, or you you know, or, or whatever it is. With the equity holders, there's no real end game in a sense. They choose the end with you by just selling out. Right? Now, the fixed income guys can do that in the secondary market. They can sell out, but then whoever they've sold that to becomes your constituency for that end game. And, and I think that gets forgotten quite a lot with, with, with debt, and specifically the, the importance for debt IR is that, is that there is that end game with your debt, debt investors. Where with, with equity, truth be told, there is no end game with them. You know. Interesting point. Yeah. All right, let's finish up our discussion there. Um, Justin Reynolds from IPRIO and Catherine Sito from Shuntak, thank you so much for a very interesting discussion.